come back five days later and it's still red and moist. That's not food. Disease and health occur big time on that level. Big time. That sounds like magic. That's the highlight of my life right now. Like, did that exposure help broaden your message? Unfortunately, what I just told you is not taught in veterinary school. I'm sure that's not the only case like that. It'll blow your mind. There is a lot more to the relationship of an animal and a person than two physical bodies. Welcome to the BK Petcast. I'm Kinsey, and my husband Bryce and I created the BK Pets and this podcast to help you enrich and extend the lives of your dogs and cats. Today we are joined by Dr. Marty Goldstein. Called the Miracle Worker by Forbes magazine, Dr. Marty has been a leading voice in integrative veterinary medicine for more than 45 years. He's the best-selling author of The Nature of Animal Healing and The Spirit of Animal Healing and has appeared on national television programs including The Oprah Winfrey Show, The Martha Stewart Show, and Good Morning America. He stars in the critically acclaimed documentary, The Dog Doc. Welcome to the show, Dr. Marty Goldstein. So Dr. Marty, first of all, thank you so much for being on today. We are absolutely honored to have you. It was so great to meet you last week at Super Zoo, and we just really appreciate you taking the time to kind of just talk with us and educate our audience. So we really appreciate it. No problem. I love doing it. First question I want to get into, you know, you graduated from Cornell in the 70s. And so when you were first starting, veterinary medicine, pet medicine had to have been vastly different than what it is now. What are some of the most significant changes you've seen from when you were in vet school and kind of getting through the, you know, the early 2000s? Well, technologically, medicine has become so advanced. I mean, I'm really impressed. You know, we could do CAT scans and dye studies to see a tumor this big in the spinal cord. You know, we figured out all the metabolic pathways, every stop physiologically or biochemically on the pathway and this and that. But the only thing that I think we lose track of when it comes to that is that it was my definition in, you know, my recent book, The, the Spirit of Animal Healing. One of my definitions is my definition of science in the field of medicine is man trying to figure out what nature created. Uh, so, yeah. you know, it blows me away how we figured all this out, but we can't create that. We can't create something that heals a cut. Nature did. The other That's thing wild. that I've seen, because, you know, I was literally one of the very first to start coming out publicly with alternative therapy, went through 35 years of absolute hell, is the slow but sure acceptance of natural therapies. And, you know, I was certified, started my certification in acupuncture in 1975. And that's when I really started to get condemned and ridiculed. And now when I go to continuing education meetings and my colleagues that ridiculed the hell out of me come up to me now certified in acupuncture, they go, God, you were so far ahead of your time. And I would just <laughs> look like, at them and say, Acupuncture has been around over 3,000 years. I'm not ahead of my time. I'm 35 <laughs> years less behind than you. Wake right. up. <laughs> so that's, that's the change I've seen. Uh, you know, I, I went back to my 50-year Cornell Vet School reunion two months ago. And what, what blows me away is the actual facility. When you look at yeah. the old little dinky facility and now this huge edifice of a Cornell Learning Center and, and large and small animal hospital. It's like night and day. It's like, whoa, imagine That's so cool. if we were at school. And, and then the biggie is the advent of modern uh, technology, you know, the cell phone, the computer and everything. So uh, the whole learning process is so much more advanced than it was. Do you kind of see the future evolving to incorporate these alternative methods as more primary care and kind of taking away some of that from conventional care? If veterinarians don't jump on the bandwagon of incorporating alternative therapy, they're gonna fall off the truck because the future is in this direction. And it has to be 
because we love our animals. You know, when I graduated in 1973, the incidence of observable incidence of cancer in dogs was about one out of 10. It was always wow. a disease of the old. Recent studies that I uh, referenced in my <clears throat> last book is one out of maybe 1.61 dogs in the United States will not get cancer. And it's a pretty prominent disease of the young. So we better, for the sake of our animals, wake up. It seems like with the the technological advances, we also kind of get into that instant gratification, you know, spiral, and we want the quick fixes and all that stuff. So I, I love what you said about, you know, veterinarians have to adopt the, these other modalities because, I mean, it seems like so many veterinarians kind of go the conventional route and then they lack the necessary resources to take care of their patients. And so that's when they start exploring the other stuff and the different things that might help. I think you said and, that and that's the way to really learn for them is by personal experience, not yeah. someone like me trying to cram it down because the ego will get in the way and they'll, I don't like this whack of yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's so like tied into their identity. Yeah. So can you tell us about your journey as a veterinarian and what led you to focus on the pet nutrition? The fact that I turned my own degenerative health state around with diet. Ooh. I mean, I was genetically shot. The gene pool on my mother's side of the family, all the males on my mother's side of the family that I took after, I had the same conditions. Not only were the, did they continue to degenerate, but they have been dead, all of them, between 10 and 30 years ago. Wow. And I had the same gene pool. So in my 20s, I was searching for answers that conventional medicine uh, didn't give me. I, you know, I, I covered the whole story in my first book, which, it, which is a trip. I wrote this book in 1999, Nature of Animal Healing. And on, we learned about three months ago on uh, bookauthority.com that it's ranked the number one best-selling veterinary medicine book of all time. Wow. Congratulations. So, yeah, that feels really, really good. I and I shared the story in there how I, you know, just by accident, quote unquote, no such thing as coincidence, stumbled upon a book on Eastern philosophy and Eastern nutrition. And it was a book that I had no interest in reading, but I really, really had to go to the bathroom, made it to my house. And I wanted something to read. And it was my girlfriend at the time left the book on the, the desk going to the bathroom. And I just grabbed it in a book and I sat down and I go, what the heck is this stuff? But it was too <laughs> late to leave the pot. So oh. I started, you know, the book was called You Are All San Paku. And, and all of a sudden it, it, it had answers that I was looking for. And I literally didn't leave the pot for 40 minutes. I was just enrolled on this book. I changed my diet. I had degenerative chronic bursitis and arthritis. Uh, I was always overweight. And all of a sudden, you know, trying to lose weight for a long time, I lost like 20 pounds in eight days eating brown rice and vegetables. And it was like, whoa. Yeah. So, wow. you know, when it worked for me, it was like, why would this work for animals? And we put my brother's dog, who was a golden retriever with severe allergies and severe hip dysplasia and arthritis uh, on a home cooked diet. And all of a sudden his allergies got better and he was running around. It was like, whoa. And I just started to look at the, le the food ingredients on labels. We were never taught to do that. We were just taught about how to balance protein and carbohydrates and fats and all of that stuff. And it was like, boy, nature didn't intend dogs to eat this stuff. You know, in those days, the only thing we fed our own animals and sold in our practice was the semi-moist foods. You know, you take a red burger, throw it in a bowl, come back five days later, and it's still red and moist. That's not food. <laughs> is that the Gaines burgers? Yeah. Love it. We were literally listening to your book. I, this is my second time, but Kenzie's first time on the way home from Super Zoo. So we got some of that insight. 
Yeah, and I mean, it's just, you know, when I used to lecture way back in the 80s, I used to, you know, put the Kodak slide up of the formula of Gainsburgers, and I would go through ingredient by ingredient to the audience. There were flavor enhancers, dyes, uh, three preservatives, the carcinogens, you know, some of them were proven to be carcinogens. And the only thing that was really missing was food. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, just really that no, small aspect. No, no biologically appropriate food substance in those things for dogs. Wow. So let me ask you this. Before you went through that kind of rapid weight loss, what was your diet like before that? Anything. Really? My theory is that the stomach acid concentration was so strong that it made no difference what you ate. The acid is going to destroy you. That's how sick okay. I was. <laughs> You know, at one time, I was going to be a professional chef instead of a veterinarian. If I didn't get into vet school, because I loved to eat, you know, pizza. I used to charboil steaks that thick and overburn them so they were really charboiled. Hot, hot fudge sundae. I mean, it, it made no difference. I had no clue yeah. on nutrition. Because, and especially since we were not taught that. And in the, my four-year medical training. When you wanted to kind of take some of the stuff that you learned and went through with that rapid weight loss to animals, how did you know what to feed? Are you learning kind of how to like feed a semi-homemade diet in vet school or were you focusing on what they ate in the wild or what was that like? Yeah, it was just all common sense. It was not taught in vet school. You know, Got it. I really, my specialty over the years became nutritional supplements. When I graduated vet school, there was one supplement for dogs and cats in the United States called Pet Tabs by a drug company called Beach and Massagill. Do you know how many supplements are you? You were at Super Zoo. <laughs> I mean, there was There's like no a thousand many... businesses there alone. Oh, right. There was one supplement in the United States. Now there's one zillion supplements for wow. the animals in the United States. So I watched the growth of that over my, my career. You know, if something worked for me, you know, I used to travel 35 miles to find the nearest health food store. Mm -hmm. And if something worked for me, I tried it on our own family, especially dogs. And, you know, just try to calculate the dose based on weight. And it was working. I mean, that's wow. the thing is clinically it was working. And then, you know, I would ask my clients if they were willing to, quote unquote, experiment along with me. And the, the, the change in their health state and especially their disease states was astounding. And all I did was try to share it with my colleagues and got right. there. That's a great, I want to kind of have you talk a little bit about the glucosamine issue, because I think pet parents now, you know, glucosamine is kind of a household name. It's in every I single mean, hip and joint product on the market, it seems. So what was it like when you were recommending glucosamine back in the 70s? 70s, right? Yeah, we had, my brother and I, he started a... Uh, this whole project for eight veterinarians in our county to build a big central hospital. Just like you would go to your local doctor and if you needed surgery, he would refer you to the local big hospital. And we built that and unfortunately, it was an astounding 13,000 square foot facility that went bankrupt. But the, the group of those veterinarians they were all conventional. 1978, my brother and I strayed. We started to get into, you know, Carvel Ticket came up and we were getting into, you know, more natural dog foods, more biologically appropriate. And I started to research supplements. And I found, you know, there's no internet then, you know, research in the libraries and books, how glucosamine supported joint function. So I started to have people go and get glucosamine supplements at health food stores for their dogs. And that group found out about it. And through one of the president veterinarians of the group, one of his clients who brought their dog to me was saying, yeah, my veterinarian is really upset that I left him to come to you. And they were thinking of getting a group together to report you to the state for treating arthritic dogs with glucosamine because you weren't using standardized veterinary care. Never happened, but it was a yeah. verbal threat. 
Unbelievable. Getting back into a little bit of like how you wanted to become a veterinarian, we understand that you had a fascination with dinosaurs growing up. I did love that them. did that lead into like you wanting to become a veterinarian? Did that impact it at all? My mother wanted to be to be a nuclear physicist, but I couldn't spell it. So <laughs> I eliminated that. That word was way too complicated. Uh, and when I started to go to college and I started to think about my future. My brother was five years ahead of me. He was at the University of, Veterinarian, uh, University of Pennsylvania Veterinary College. And then it became a no brainer for me. I loved animals. I want to become a vet. That was it. My favorite book of all time, by far, not only about the topic, but the philosophy, the medical and scientific philosophy in this book through the character Dr. Malcolm was Jurassic Park. I quoted really? Jurassic Park in my first book. And I quote, every time I lecture, I take sections of the original Jurassic Park and put it up there on Michael Crichton's take on the ages, you know, from the dark ages to the Renaissance, to the age, the industrial revolution, to the age of science and how the age starts, grows really big, and then all of a sudden it's not fitting anymore to the planet, why the Renaissance crashed, why the Industrial Revolution, you know, crashed. And he just shows now the age of science is no longer fitting the earth. It's destroying wow. the earth. We have the ability to make things that are destructive and we can't regulate them like nuclear war and all of that stuff. Yeah. The philosophy on in Jurassic Park behind the dinosaurs is amazing. Love it. I recommend rereading that book. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I honestly, like I grew up with Jurassic Park, but I didn't even realize they had a book. So uh, it's unbelievable. I'm telling so you, cool. Michael Crichton was amazing. I ran Love into it. him. I got permission from him verbally at a picnic to include sectors of Jurassic Park in my first book when it came out. And then I asked awesome. him, I said, when the book comes out, I would love to send you a copy. And you know what he said to me? Hmm. I don't read. <laughs> <laughs> he unfortunately died of leukemia, I think. Well, uh, well, never that's too bad. Yeah. Wow. So interesting. Following in the footsteps of a family member can sometimes be challenging. What was it like having a brother in the same profession? Was there any ever like friendly competition? Or not friendly or competition? animosity, <laughs> growing pains? What was that like? We got along great. Two different kinds of people. We <laughs> supported each other. He was more conventional. I was the hippie. I was selling turquoise jewelry out of my practice. I made oh, five times the amount of money selling turquoise jewelry than I did as a veterinarian. Wow. And then his wife, my sister-in-law, got into it. We actually started our own turquoise jewelry company. So cool. <laughs> so the, the interesting thing is I was really sharp medically in Cornell. One time I was number two in my class. So there was challenging here and there. Well, what my brother taught me was the common sense, not the medical sense, of how to successfully run a practice. Mm. And I was on my way to Denver. I think I shared the story with you at uh, SuperZoo. I had my mail forwarded to my best friend in Denver because I was going to set up a practice in Boulder. I was done for, with the East Coast. And... You know, I was like a week away from leaving the East Coast to go to Colorado. Crazy. And then my brother called me and offered me his practice because a veterinarian close to where he lived uh, had passed away and his practice was up for sale and they really wanted to be there. So I stayed on the East Coast because I was getting my own practice and it was really exciting. And then that deal fell through and all of a sudden, my brother and I wound up partners. <laughs> wow. So then, 
when you guys got into the holistic space, was it one of your ideas first or was it a general consensus that that was the direction to go? Well, my brother strayed from conventional by creating or doing all the legwork for cryosurgery. Oh. And, you know, I took that over. My specialty became cryosurgery. And I'm infiltrating cryosurgery now with the Cornell. A lot of veterinarians are doing it, but they're freezing little warts and tumors. Uh, I don't know if you saw the documentary. No. Oh, you got to see the documentary that my friend made on me. Amazing. Please send it because I didn't even know there was one. Oh, you can get it on, on Pluto for free. It's called The Dog Doc. It'll blow your mind. Her last documentary, it, it's uh, right here. Amazing. Yeah. Her, her, she was not a filmographer. 30 years ago, she brought her dog to me that was literally going to be euthanized that day for persistent high fevers, non-responsive. And she was in a pet store crying, and the lady came up to console her, said, what's going on? And she said, I have to put my dog to sleep today. And she goes, did you call Marty Goldstein? And she goes, who's Marty Goldstein? So she called on a Friday. Uh, I was always so busy. I called her back at 11 o'clock at night, Friday night, wow. which blew her mind because her own doctor would never call her like that. And then she, I said, what's going on? And she said, my dog has the sharp A syndrome chronic high fevers, you know, non-responsive drugs. And I said, don't you see your dog's immune system is trying to do so something and you keep on stopping it with drugs? And she said that line changed her life. Later on in life, she got into filming and she followed the original Horse Whisperer, Buck Granneman around, did a documentary and it made the shortlist for the Academy Awards. Wow. wow. So after she was done with that, she said, you're next. And she came in and filmed for three years. Didn't really capture what I became known for, uh, the most stressful three years of my life. But we were winning awards at festivals all over the United States, premiered in New York City. We were set for three theaters in Hollywood and the next day COVID shut all the theaters in the United States down. So this was like very recently. Yeah, probably about four years. It was right before, you know, the, the day COVID shut everything down. What's yeah. interesting, is Rotten Tomatoes two months ago listed our documentary, even though it never came out publicly, in the top 100 nature documentaries of all time. Oh my gosh, that yeah, is you, amazing. You, you gotta see this documentary, but in the documentary, you will see a dog that literally had medically and scientifically maybe a month to live with a bone tumor eating its entire jaw that spread to its lymph system and its lungs. And what we did with cryosurgery and nutritional supplements with this dog, it is amazing. So my brother straight created cryosurgery. Uh, this was really interesting because he was conservative. I was not. <laughs> I was a hippie. I was selling turquoise jewelry. And then... Uh, I, I read this book, I changed my diet, and I lost all this weight. And he goes, what are you doing? And I gave him a copy of the book. And I was waiting for him to just, you know, to try to read it and go, you are whacked. Because yeah. this book is crazy. <laughs> and a week later, he called, we were on the phone. And he said, I finished that book. And I said, so what did you think? And I was waiting for this. Oh, my God. And he said these exact words. You don't expect me to practice medicine anymore, do you? He got it. He got wow. it right there. He started to change his diet. He got healthy. He was always genetically stronger than me. He still is. Uh and now that, that was it. And we started the, the path together. I want to backtrack a little bit for our audience that doesn't know. And by our audience that doesn't know, I mean myself. Can you explain what cryosurgery is? Cryo is the controlled freezing of a disease, especially a tumor. So if you have a tumor of the jaw, conventional medicine does what's called a heavy mandibulectomy. Cuts here, cuts there, and removes that part of the jaw. 
cryosurgery goes into the tumor, freezes it, destroys the tumor, and then the rotting tumor actually stimulates the immune system locally and systemically. So you're having about four slices of cake and eat it too. Less anesthesia, less pain, less cutting, and immune, immune stimulating. And when I was at Cornell for my reunion, I took the new head of clinical sciences, I stuck him in a room, and I did a 90-minute PowerPoint presentation on cryosurgical cases backed up by nutritional supplements and diet. Every single one of these dogs was either hopeless, non-surgical, or, you know, this is deemed by the establishment, you know, the, the universities, some of the biggest veterinary hospitals in the United States. And I showed every single case four to nine and a half years later with the biopsies, with the photographs. And at the end of it, I looked at him and his mind was blown. I said, you can't do this. Why don't you want your university to be able to do this for our animals? And he goes, man, I got it. I'm going to infiltrate you into this school. So that's, that's why I'm going awesome. back uh, on October 7th and not to the AHVMA. <laughs> yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, what are you specifically doing with Cornell or what's kind of the mission here? Oh, the mission is for them to more broadly accept, you know, they they're now have embraced acupuncture. They're starting, you know, nutritional supplements are becoming more popular, glucosamine, milk thistle for liver disease. I want them to see this at a higher, higher level. And I think cryosurgery, since it is a conventional modality, but in its infancy of veterinary medicine, where I've taken it way up here, you can even see my hand, is I want to use that as the intro, the bridge into, and just say, you know, what's really weird, how close I came, is Cornell Vet School had a holistic club maybe eight or nine years ago, they invited me to speak. And I gave a three hour lecture at the Cornell Vet School. And as the lecture was starting, within the first four minutes, I was doing my intro, this very distinguished gentleman walks into the back of the lecture hall and he caught my eye. And I said, just joking around, oh, you're here, now we can start the lecture. We're just kidding around. He stayed for the whole thing. And I started by presenting a three and a half month old dog with a huge tumor in the major pad in its pore that spread to its lymph node. They wanted to amputate the leg. The dog came to me and did cryosurgery, put the dog on supplements. And then I showed serological photographs every one to three weeks, all the way up to a year. And at the end of a year, you couldn't even see where the original tumor was. Then I showed the dog eight years old. He saw this. His own surgical technician, he was going to amputate the leg of that dog because it had the same cancer type. And he said, I'm not, I'm not amputating your dog's leg. Bring the dog to Marty. This was my breakthrough. The head of surgery at the Cornell Vet School is referring a case to me that I know I can handle really well. The lady had a death in the family. She had to stay for the funeral. By the time all that was over, the tumor grew, took over the leg and he had amputated. That's how close I got. Now that you're kind of successfully infiltrating it, are you still finding some resistance to the stuff that you want to teach? Oh, you always will. Really? There will always be those that have already made the decision that this is crazy. And what they're going to have to do is just die off. I know both sides of this, the spectrum so well. I know conventional medicine so well. And I just know where it's lacking. And the true veterinarian is the one that uses both modalities. That's true. Agreed. True holistic medicine yeah. is not the opposite side from conventional medicine. It's the umbrella looking yeah. at the whole picture and the whole patient. Period. And I... I just don't get why that's not primary care. I mean, logically to me, it just makes sense to look at a patient and be like, okay, 
there's all these different modalities. What one fits this specific person or animal the best? And it, I just, I don't know. What subsidizes vets medical schools? Well, the drug deal. companies and the conventional pet food industry, yep. which is a Absolutely. cereal based industry. And they subsidize the entire profession. So you're not going to see it. Moving a little bit more to today, what in your experience are the most pressing issues that pets and, you know, inadvertently pet parents are facing, you know, disease wise or, or anything like that? Cancer is number one in dogs. Renal failure is number one in cats. Got it. And then every other disease. No major chronic illness is being controlled. They're being treated, but not controlled. Yeah. And so the, these treatments, they're just addressing the symptoms, I'm assuming? Yeah. What is a fever? A, an aspirin deficiency? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. they, like they say, DCM is a grain deficiency. <laughs> yeah. We, we, I mean, we, it's, it's all crazy. And it's just one thing we never learn in school is the purpose of disease. I love disease. In my first book, by far, in all the chapters I wrote in all my books, the most important chapter I ever wrote is called The Healing Crisis in my first book. I read it to myself every year. And it is why nature creates disease, a discharge. What does the Latin term itis mean? Colitis, enteritis, gastritis, amnia, otitis. Conjunctivitis. It's Latin for inflammation. The body creates inflammation in an attempt to heal the body. Period. What does medicine do with inflammation? Reduces it. Cortisol. Anti-inflammatories. Non-steroid anti-inflammatories. So we are stopping nature. And I'll tell you one thing. You know the old saying, when you go against nature or don't mess around with nature, she doesn't care. <laughs> I mean, look what look look what happened, you know, with these hurricanes and this and that. You know, you'll all of a sudden have an entire city within a minute and a half totally destroyed by the wrath of nature. And when you start going against nature inside the body, watch out. Going against nature, you know what that's called in, in the field of medicine? Cancer. Simple. Wow. We've been looking for the cure for cancer and the cause for cancer at the two to three trillion dollars a year on this planet. The cure for cancer is simple. Health. God, if it wasn't for his tumor, he was in great shape. Bull. If it wasn't for his heart attack, he really looked in good shape. No. It's a lack of health. Do you feel like there's a link between the rise in commercially processed pet food and the diseases that we see today? Do I think? No, it's a scientific proven. Look at the work. Oh, okay. of Dr. Look at the work of Dr. Greg Ogilvy, who was the head of internal medicine and cancer at Colorado State University, which was the leading of all the vet schools in cancer work. And he showed, he demonstrated that the byproducts of cereal metabolism, which is glucose and especially lactate, supply the growth of cancer cells. Wow, it's all the literature. Yeah, it's basically a direct correlation, it seems. Yep. So what do you feel is the best diet for cats and dogs? Well, it, it's not one diet. You know, the, the, the there's a big difference between scientifically appropriate diet, which is what we learned, you know, all these scientific diets. Yeah, they work. Just like if you were constantly tired and I put you on speed or amphetamine, you would scientifically really wake up. So there's a big difference between scientifically appropriate diet and biologically appropriate diet. And then you wonder why these diets are on the market to the point that they're the number one selling, you know, and why a lot of the conventional veterinary nutritionists think that corn is the most appropriate protein to feed a dog. What? Then it's this. <laughs> the first law of statistics. If the statistics don't support your viewpoint, you obviously need more statistics. The second law of statistics. 
Given enough statistics, you could prove anything. So they'll they'll hone their studies in the direction they want to so they could sell a billion dollars worth of their products. Show me one tooth in a dog or a cat's mouth flat for grinding grain. Not a single one exists. Is it safe to assume that, you know, for dogs and cats, it's generally higher protein content, more protein from animal sources, more whole foods, that kind of general stuff? That's it. It's biologically appropriate. You know, there's a whole shift in consciousness because of the, the destructive aspect of the meat industry to the planet Earth. And I'm, I agree with that 100%. Uh, and there's a whole movement to create plant-based or insect-based, like, you know, crickets, food for dogs, and especially cats. And when I see that work, I'm all for it. But I've seen animals try to be made vegan over my career suffer like crazy. It'll work in some. I've seen some really old animals that had great healthy lives on a plant-based diet. You know, their care their caretakers really know what they were doing and stuff like that. So, you know, that that's the trend. But right now the big thing is to feed dogs biologically appropriate. And I always don't you know, I hate finding the ideal diet for a companion animal and only feeding that. Mm -hmm. I mean, how crazy would you go if you only ate brown rice and vegetables and salad every meal of your life? Yeah. So I always like to teach people 10 different levels of nutrition. You know, I'm telling you at Super Zoo, I was not eating ideally. <laughs> yeah, us, <laughs> us either. either. I, I totally mean, the restaurants, they were incredible. But, you know, if you know where to aim towards, you could always get better. If your dog has a chronic degenerative illness, then always aim towards the most biologically appropriate. My dogs are very healthy. They love pizza. So when we have pizza, they get the crust with a little of the pizza on it because they're healthy. If my dog had cancer, I wouldn't give pizza. Like I always say, no two snowflakes are alike. So tell me that no two dogs are exactly alike with two cats. They're right. so different. What will work for one may not work for the other. So, yeah. you know, I don't like blanket. That's one problem with the internet is that a supplement that cured this dog's lung cancer. Oh, I found the cure for my dog's lung cancer. The next 10 is not going to work on because we're all different. That's why I always recommend for the people out there, if you really, really want to care properly for your companion animal, Find a veterinarian, well-trained, well-experienced in integrative medicine. And the best listing of that is the ahvma.org. American Holistic Veterinary Medical Association.org has a listing of all the integrated veterinarians in North America, what their modalities are, city, town, state, period. Going back to the plant-based and vegan diets for animals, when you were seeing animals suffer on these diets, do you think it was uh, a formulation issue where they weren't getting all the proper nutrients, or do you think it was a carnivore eating only plants issue? That was it. Lack of taurine, really? lack of L-carnitine. I shared the story in my first book, the one from 1999, the original troop of vegans brought their dog to me. The dog's name was vegan. This dog had serious breast cancer and they had to make a loop around the exam table because the dog was trying to kill me. <laughs> and animals really sense me and really like me. And they refused to feed, feed me protein. And this dog's wow. protein levels based on the blood were off the scale. And you go, whoa, that's good. No, a diabetic has very high blood sugar because they don't have insulin taking the sugar from the blood into the cell. So a dog 
that doesn't have the, the proper proteins is going to search for that protein. Where are they going to get it? From their own muscle. So this dog was emaciated. Oh. What does a cancer patient look like? They're emaciated because the, the immune system, immunoglobulins, are made of proteins. So when, when the immune system is not working, the body naturally is searching for more protein. So it attacks its own muscle system. That's why cancer patients always look emaciated. And the protein levels in their blood are very high because it's not being utilized by the immune system. Unfortunately, what I just told you is not taught in veterinary school. <laughs> Seems like most of the good information we're yeah, talking it, about right now is not. <laughs> Your approach is all about improving overall health rather than uh, just treating diseases. Can you share a success story where this philosophy made a significant difference in an animal's life? I'm sure you got lots of them. This guy, and when I lecture, I put this case up and I put video in the lecture on at the end of his comment. Him and his wife lived in Brooklyn and they were walking down the street and they saw a pit bull tied to a tree. They adopted the dog. He didn't like dogs. He fell in love with Elsa. They got divorced. He kept Elsa. Elsa was diagnosed, went to the Long Island Veterinary Hospital, big specialty facility, had cancer of the tonsil, squamous cell carcinoma that spread to the lymph node. They removed the tonsil, biopsied it, removed the lymph node, biopsied it. When they got the result back, they said, this is out of our hands and referred to the largest veterinary hospital in the United States, the Animal Medical Center, in New York City, nine stories tall. And the number one oncologist there gave this dog six weeks to live, maybe with chemotherapy, three to four months to live. So he comes to me. And when I always, when I saw a cancer patient, I would consult at least a, an hour long. They know their dog is going to die. They've been told their dog is going to die. And Dogs sense our energetic output. That's been proven. They know if you're going to have a seizure 24 hours before. They know if you got bladder cancer now, blah, blah, blah. So I start by showing them before and after pictures of hopeless cases. So it turns their viewpoint around on hope. I'm talking for a half hour. This guy doesn't look at me once. And finally, I say to him, what the hell are you doing here? In those words. And he looks up. He says, what do you mean? I said, why are you here? You haven't heard a word I said. You haven't looked at one thing I did. You haven't looked at me. And he goes, I'll tell you the truth. My fiance found you online. And if I didn't come here, she'd kill me. <laughs> and I know my dog's going to die because the head honcho said that. So I looked at him and said, well, you're literally a waste of life. <laughs> and I just went in on him and I said these things and all of a sudden he looks up, he has tears rolling down his, his eyes. He walks around the table and hugs me and he goes, that's what I needed to hear. This and that. So I said, you just waited, wasted 35 minutes of a one hour consult. Do you want to work on Elsa? He goes, yeah, let's go for it. So... I take blood samples. I start the dog on about eight or nine supplements. And then I said, I'll add more uh, supplements in when I get the results. He becomes an animal. He hires two professional chefs to prepare for the dog. He imports organic salmon from Norway and he buys organic filet mignon. And he adds in another at least 18 supplements on his own. Wow. He's spending ten to $12,000 a month on this dog. So he comes up from Long Island to me, hour and 20 minutes, every five days for me to check the dog's throat. I mean, we're talking about obsession. Three months into the therapy, I look in 
and I see a recurrence of the cancer growing where they took the tonsil out. I photograph it, I biopsy, I freeze it with cryosurgery. It takes about 12 minutes. Oh, wow. Get the results back. Highly aggressive squamous cell carcinoma. Keep the dog on supplements. Six and a half months into the therapy, Elsa grows cancer back in the same exact spot. I go in there, I biopsy it, squamous cell carcinoma. I freeze it again. So now I have quadruple confirmation of the cancer that is shown in lectures. So they can't look back and say, oh, the, the original biopsy was a mistake. It was never cancer to begin with. Elsa goes on to live nine and a half years. Oh my God. Given six weeks to live by one of the number one oncologists. And, you know, I became friendly with the, this oncologist. He's a totally cool guy, sharp. He's the oncologist that the vets, the drug companies hire to create chemotherapeutics. Wow. Uh, mm. But he, he never got it. He never grasped it. And it's funny that I, I shared this story with Martha Stewart when I had my own show with her for six years called Ask Martha's Vet on Sirius Radio. And she had me on her TV show at least four or five times. She said, I want that dog on my show. So Steve came in with Elsa and we showed the pictures. We showed everything. It was just a great piece. The oncologist just so happened to be watching the show. He called Steve. We didn't mention where the hospital was. We didn't mention any names. We just said a very prominent oncologist and one of the leading hosp veterinary hospitals in the country. And he was so upset that we shared this story on national TV. Instead of embracing, oh my God, you know, this dog scientifically had six, eight weeks to live and lived nine and a half years. So the end of the story is Elsa's kidneys started to fail because she was old. She was 15 by this time. And Steve had an appointment to bring Elsa in, like on a Wednesday or something like that. His mother passes away, so he can't make his appointment. Can he bring the next day? Absolutely. Elsa had magic carpet. Hurricane Sandy hit his area. He lived in Long Beach, Long Island, right on the water, and destroyed everything there. The roads were shut down. There were no gas stations. He couldn't bring Elsa up. So... He said uh, his veterinary, veterinarian's local hospital was totally destroyed. Oh, my gosh. He went and found a FedEx truck that was not allowed to drive anywhere near his house, gave the guy a couple of hundred dollars and said, if I had something shipped to FedEx, would you get it to me? I sent Steve intravenous fluids, intravenous vitamin C, and injectable homeopathic kidney extracts. He set up a mock hospital in his house, got a licensed veterinary technician to come to his house and the veterinarian to set up the intravenous. And Elsa, who is dying of kidney failure, lived another year. Oh my God. <laughs> it's, it's like the greatest story of all time. And I oh present this story. And I present at the very end a video of Steve sharing his experience of how the oncologist literally, you know, he was scientific, like he said, I wish I could play it on the computer. Uh, could I share my screen? You know, I'll never forget when, um, when she was diagnosed before I met you. I had to have three more biopsies. So I went to the three best guys. And but when I got to the top guy, he was signed, they were scientifically correct, but he took the stake and hammered it in. He just hammered it in. You know, he just stopped short of saying, if you want, you could put it asleep. And I remember I went home that day. She was going to die. And I, I, felt like, I felt the guy was going with it. You know, 
I had talked with you for 45 minutes in the exam room. Elsa sat in the corner. And I'm like, aren't you going to examine her? And he looked at me and he said, no, if I don't spend the time to extract all the negativity of nothing can be done, we're not going to be in a position to do anything for her. And I remember I looked at you, tears came from my eyes. I walked around the table, hugged you, and said those were the words I needed to hear. You were imbued with hopelessness. Mm -hmm. We need you to help heal her. Mm -hmm. She's the healer of her. We're the guides. Your guidance was over there. You were shot. Shot. I couldn't get to her because you were that way. You filled me with hope like a swimming pool. And that was the one. And that was the world that the right. fight started. Hope precedes healing. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Absolutely incredible. <laughs> I, it's so cool to see somebody that like was so, you know, like like you said in the video, so hopeless. And then just a an hour long conversation with them, not only does that turn around their mindset, but that's what starts the healing process too, right? Exactly. This is a three month old puppy. You see its its foot? Yeah. Look at that tumor. This is a wow. three month old puppy owned by a breeder. There is the confirmation of the cancer at Colorado State by Barbara Powers, who was considered the number one pathologist in veterinary medicine in the United States. There was the recommendation by the local advanced veterinary care to do chemotherapy and radiation. When the, 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 the breeder who had the dog read my book, he said to his veterinarian, what about cryosurgery? And word for word, the veterinarian said, that kook, do not go there. I know who you're talking about. So the guy called, he came down to kook them. <laughs> That's me freezing the tumor. That's cryosurgery. That's a cryosurgical oh. probe. The white is the tumor being frozen. That didn't cure anything. That just arrested the monster as we worked on the immune system nutritional supplements. When I got the blood back, I added more in. That's one week later, two weeks later. Oh my gosh. Five weeks later, four and a half months later, seven and a half months. That's the dog and the wow. breeder at seven and a half months of age. The dog's name was Doc. That was the original tumor, notice the date, and that's one year later. You can't even see it. I and mean, this is what I wrote in my first book. And I wrote in my first book, cancer is the ultimate excuse to get healthy. Wow. I mean, you so, can't even tell anything ever happened to that. That's part. right. And this is the stuff that I have the confidence right now to share, you know, and I presented to Cornell an hour and a half of cases like that of these yeah. dogs were criti critically hopeless. And, you know, right now I'm so confident because I know what they're thinking. That dog needs its leg amputated. Yeah. Every veterinarian in the United States is gonna say that. Plus the lymph node was at least three to four times uh, normal size, draining the cancer, and that shrunk down to normal because we had the immune system. To, to see something, I mean, that tumor was so prevalent and to just see it progressively get better and better without the, you know, without the intervention of a ton of conventional practices. I know you said cryotherapy is kind of conventional, but kind of that bridge. I mean, that's absolutely unbelievable. That had to have felt incredible for you, but I'm sure that's not the only case like that. Well, that see, that's the whole thing. Wait until you watch the documentary. Yeah. All absolutely. I got to say, it'll blow your mind. Every conventional veterinarian that came to one of the film festivals where it showed around the country, every single one of them gave me the thumbs up and said, you did it. You demonstrated the need for true integrative medicine in our profession. Wow. Absolutely incredible. Yep. So then uh, I want to get into a little bit of your current business practices and kind of the ventures that you're currently doing. So you have your own line of food and supplements. What specifically about your products makes them different from something, say, you might find in like a classic grocery store for dogs yeah, and cats? Great question. So 
after a while, my practice became an albatross for me because I was specializing in hopeless cases. We did a six week survey years back on my patients, my clients. My average client was 590 miles away from my clinic. Wow. There's no, no specialty hospital has that because I was the only one doing it to this level. Yeah. So, you know, when you see a cancer patient, especially one that's failed conventional therapy, it, it's not easy to turn them around and it's not a quick fix. So I would spend 12 to 15 hours a day, literally seven days a week, because cancer does no weekends, working on, you know, an hour and a half to, to educate one person to start treatment on one patient. And at the end of a 15 hour day, I was getting to maybe five, six or seven animals a day. And it was very frustrating when I knew that I could reach literally the world. And then finally, I was able to sell my practice. You'll see it in the documentary who I sold it to, to, to take over the clinical practice. I hooked up with an incredible company on the West Coast that designs the highest level of food and supplements. And I put my 47 years of experience and clinical research into the formation of these supplements. And we are now literally reaching tens of thousands on a weekly so cool. basis. Because yeah. it, you know, it's spread like crazy. What makes mine different? I mean, there's a lot of great products out there is the supplements have my 47 years of experience. When I put them together, you know, between my associates, the animals I consulted on through other veterinarians and the animals I saw, I got near a quarter of a million patients. So wow. I got a lot of experience. Wow. Yeah. And these supplements have that experience. One of the problems that we have right now is what we, we, lovingly called Dr. Google. And as much as Google has an enhanced our educational system and, and the availability of knowledge, it's also led to confusion. I can't tell you how many animals and people I saw where they come in, they have a box of 18 different supplements that they read about on Google and their dog is still dying because there, it's, there's a lot of confusion. So my supplements have the advantage of all those years of experience. And my food is freeze dried, freeze drying of the food, which I didn't think was as good as good old raw. But I learned so much is that it seals the peak of nutrition in at the point of freeze dry. There was a study oh. on blueberries, where as blueberries sit in on the shelf before you buy it, the antioxidant concentration diminishes. Wow. If you freeze dry it at the highest point when it's ripe, coming off the vine, that level of antioxidant stays permanent for up to two years. So uh, it knocked down all the water content, so it became extremely light to ship. So we didn't need you know, to get raw diet out to the rest of society. You need refrigerated trucks, refrigeration at the source point, refrigeration where they're going to sell it or store it. And the weight was like astronomical. So it knocked all of that down. It stays shelf stable for a long time. Taking the water out actually diminishes the chance of pathogen contamination because these pathogens need moisture to grow up. So it's like five slices of cake and eat it too. There's a lot of good freeze dried foods in the market. What makes mine different is the regulatory board under the FDA is called AFCO, A-A-F-C-O. And in order to get something on the shelf, you have to apply to and pass AFCO regulations. And any processing of food usually destroys a lot of the vitamins and minerals, especially heating. So when you look at the label, it's this long. Selenium, sulfate, thiamine, and a nitrate, different forms of vitamin D. And those things are put back, unfortunately, in synthetic form. And synthetic vitamins are not healthy. Those synthetic nutraceuticals are not healthy to the body. If you look at our formula of our food, 
We meet AFCO requirements and regulations with nothing added. Our scientists figured out what food would supply the necessary amount of everything. So when you look at the label, you see all food. So it's so cool. really simulating what nature is intended for dogs and cats to eat. And the, the best thing about it is the zillions of testimonials of thanks that I've gotten in the last six years from people on not only the turnaround in the health state of their companion animal, but how rapid it was like, what, are you kidding me? <laughs> it's happening really quick. You didn't get any calls from veterinarians that had hopeless cases where the people went online, bought food and supplements, they turned around to veterinarians and called me saying, what are you doing? Can I learn? Can I buy the, the food? Can I sell it my practice? So that's the highlight of my life right now. Oh, that's so cool. Now, let me ask you, is it the same parent company? Like I saw Dr. Richter right next door. Is his line under the same kind of parent company? Yuck. Got they it. have 25 Got lines it. in the human field. Their oh, number wow. one line is Dr. Stephen Gundry, the cardiac surgeon who wrote yeah. the book, The Paradox. Yeah, He's Stephen Gundry is, is who, the brilliant. first podcast I listened to with Dr. Karen Becker when I busted through the door and was like, we got to change everything. <laughs> so yeah, Stephen yeah. Gundry, Dr. He, Karen, they were my influences. Trip. He, the, the, he's their number one line. And I love the guy. He is just, you know, so I love the company. We're doing yeah. great. Yeah, so incredible. Well, the booth looked absolutely amazing. So circling back to your book, The Spirit of Animal Healing, what is the one thing you hope people take away when they're reading that? There is a lot more to the relationship of an animal and a person than two physical bodies. The first book was called The Nature of Animal Healing. Nature had two meanings. The nature in which a body heals and nature is the healer, not the doctor. Spirit of Animal Healing, spirit has two different meanings. Uh, it is in the spirit of healing. You know, like, like what we did with Steve, we got his hopelessness in, in his spiritual aspect up before we did it. And in the spirit of healing. And yeah. the other is looking at the relationship of owners or their guardians or whatever you want to call them. And the companion animal on a spiritual level. So, you know, the physical man has five senses. There are probably over 50 perceptions in the physical universe. How many radio waves and ultraviolet rays are hitting your body right now? Uh, probably a lot. Do you feel them? Do you hear them? Oh. Ultrasonics? So if you were to take an infrared photograph of you and your dog, you're not going to see two physical bodies. You see two overlapping fields in infrared spectrum. Disease and health occur big time on that level. Big time. So, you know, psychosomatic illnesses and stuff like that. And, you know, your companion animal is a reflection of you. Their entire life is revolving around you, not going to work, not going shopping. So as your, let's say, auric field changes, diminishes from depression, you know, you know your dog's in the, uh, you're depressed and this and that, that is going to physically affect your animal but on a non-physical way, so you can't see it. So that's what the spirit of animal healing is about. Wow, that's amazing. Looking forward, where do you see holistic or integrative medicine going? Is there any like new treatments or anything that you're seeing that you think is really going to be the future? Well, I wrote about it in the book. Oh, there's my doggies. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, a therapy... You know, after 45 years, I didn't think I'd run across anything that was going to change my life with what I've seen for 45 years. Pulsed electromagnetic frequency, PEMF. It's amazing. Technology was created by Nikolai Tesla, the genius. Mm -hmm. Not Elon Musk, Nikolai <laughs> Tesla. And it's, you know, it's a vibrational aspect on a cellular level in balance with the earth. And we treated thousands of animals I treated hundreds of people just as friends, blown away. Comes out of the NASA space program, the modern day aspect of it. And 
you know, there's so much scientific backing of it, PubMed, NIH studies. The other thing they can't explain is how it works so quickly. And it's miraculous. It doesn't care about the diagnosis, has really no known side effects when used properly. So that's, and it's starting to get accepted in veterinary medicine, big in the horse field. Uh, you know, I hung out with Andrew Weil many years ago, and he was lecturing on integrative human medicine. It's called the Bravewell Collaborative. And we had lunch together, and, you know, we went through the derivation. When I started, it was called holistic medicine, which I don't like. It's too airy-fairy. Then it went into complementary medicine, where one's complementing the other. Then we hit the wonderful world of integrative medicine. And then he said, as he was speaking, and we had lunch together, you know, we should just be calling it one medicine. And now the way I feel is someone that puts both worlds together, it's just good medicine. Yeah. It's not one or the other. It's both. It's good. It's, it's practicing good medicine. It's opening so many more tools in your toolbox to take care of your patient as a doctor, period. Going back a little bit to the, the, the PEMF therapy, pulse electromagnetic uh, frequency, right? Yep. That, I, I believe we read in your book that animals, I mean, especially horses, will voluntarily go up and put their hurt leg on this machine. That sounds like magic. We know that they these animals have senses we don't have. Hearing, smelling, dogs can smell something across the room. But they also know when you're going to have a seizure up to 24 hours before. So what are they detecting on the electromagnetic spectrum? So this and that. So when you take a PEMF device that's putting out any, a pulsed electromagnetic frequency at the same vibration of the Earth called the Schumann resonance, I think it's 6.8 hertz, they're going to detect it. We don't. Wow. Very so then what is what is this uh, therapy good for? Is it designed for specific things or is it good for a whole array of different things? Take any condition your mind, your human mind can think about, put it in Google and put the letters P-E-M-F and you'll find some kind of references on how it helps really? reverse it. I mean, even things like cancer? Yes, and a lot of alternative therapies are not indicated with cancer, like acupuncture, unless you're a Chinese master. Got it. This thing actually helps shrink cancer cells. It helps oxygenate them, remove the inflammation. And in a study I found, it, it increases the absorption of a medicinal up to 200% into the area that is treated. So it enhances whatever you're giving to treat the condition into the area treated. It's amazing. So does this work too with like more mental things like anxiety, things like that too? My understanding is it is now NIH approved to treat depression and autism. Oh my wow. God. I think it's the answer to all of these diseases that we hear about Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, MS, because on a cellular level, it doesn't care what the diagnosis is. It just realigns the energetic pulsed electromagnetic frequency fields inside the cell so it can heal. It helps nature heal. What, what, what are the things we did that adds to the disease state we're seeing so much on this planet is we've insulated the planet. Roads, rubber soles, mm -hmm. tires, concrete buildings, so we blocked the energetic frequency between the planet Earth and, and the physical body. And it adds to the oh, disease wow. state. What this does, it, it doesn't care. It just puts that right frequency back into the cell. Wow. So yeah. that's why it's so important to do like grounding and stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's incredible. Um, so I want to ask you about a different type of therapy, and this is just more for my own interest, but can you tell me a little bit about high dose vitamin C therapy? Because that was one of the things you wrote about in your book yeah. that is very beneficial, it seems. I treated over 40,000 patients with intravenous vitamin C. I've had really? it myself. It is scientifically proven to kill cancer cells. And we used to use it solely for cancer. 
But so many of these cancer patients, other conditions got better, their skin conditions, their arthritis. So we started to use it for so many chronic non-responsive degenerative illnesses. And what was really interesting, when COVID first hit, I found a study from Shanghai, how intravenous vitamin C was reversing COVID positive clinical patients. Then I went into the NIH, National Institute of Health in the federal government, and I found a study how three grams of vitamin C given intravenous was very successful in turning around COVID. Three grams is nothing. The proper therapy, especially for something like COVID, is somewhere up to a half to a, a gram per pound. When I get intravenous vitamin C, I get 60 grams in an hour and a half. Wow. And you can't take that much orally or burn out your intestine. So oh. even though they were tremendously underdosing, there was a hospital in New York City when COVID first hit that wrote a scientific report that I found on how successful treating their patients with three grams of intravenous vitamin C was. They're way underdosing it and it still worked. Why does the medicine, why didn't, why didn't we hear Fauci talk about intravenous vitamin C? Didn't hear anyone talk about it. No. Like, I, I mean, literally the only person I've ever heard talk about it is you. I'm, I don't have the most exposure. You'll see it in but... the documentary big time. Gotcha. That's incredible. So speaking of the documentary, how do you feel like, like, did that exposure help broaden your message? Unfortunately, like I said, it was buried. Mm. If it had hit, I would have been invited on the big shows because Buck was when she brought out Buck. And, you know, the big shows, the Lenos and those kind of things, which would have really broadened the exposure to help animals. So unfortunately, it got better, a, a buried. What really helped me on, you know, after 1986, I literally went into hiding. You'll see it in, in the documentary because my brother and I lectured on cancer patients. One of my best friends and his wife stood outside the door in the lecture hall saying, don't go in there. The Goldsteins lost their mind. And he was one of my best friends. Wow. And then 2007, I scored Martha Stewart and Oprah Winfrey the same year. Two of the three most powerful women with Queen Elizabeth on the planet Earth. Yeah. And it wasn't my looks or personality. It was the work. <laughs> and that started to change things around. I had no drawback in confronting anyone on this work because I really knew it worked. I have emails from Oprah at the end of the first week of therapy saying, I am in disbelief how well my dog Sophie is doing on your program. Unreal. And it was intravenous vitamin C. <laughs> was it really? Yep. Oh, great. Yeah, the story is in the spirit of animal healing. The whole Oprah story is in the spirit of animal healing. Yeah, absolutely. That's so incredible. So then kind of thinking rather than, you know, the perspective of pet parents, looking at vets, if you were a vet now, you know, eight, or maybe 18, 19 years old or getting into vet school, 21, 22, what advice would you give them? Wake up. Yeah. Start to broaden your horizon outside of vet school. You know, society is now demanding it. So they have to. I can't tell you how much I learned over the years from my clients, especially once the internet came out. Because as a working veterinarian, 15 hours a day, you don't have time to go home and research stuff and learn. Yeah. Right. You know, you barely have time to eat and sleep. So many of my clients, when their animals got sick, spent hours on the internet and said, oh, did you, did you see this research? Did you see this, this study on blah, blah supplements with this? And this? I learned so much from my clients. Yeah. So, you know, open your mind and start to explore the avenue of alternative therapies. Love it. Love it. So lastly, Dr. Marty, <laughs> what's on the horizon for research initiatives, products, your brand, your brand, books. yeah, all of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the company behind me, you know, they built me a 172,000 square foot manufacturing plant in Wisconsin. I wow. took a tour of it, mind 
my mind was blown. It was a 90 minute tour. And I couldn't believe what I learned on the tour about the proper way to really make a good food. Two months after they opened this huge plant, the connecting hallway between the different parts of the plant was bigger than my high school. <laughs> what? Two months later, they signed contracts to expand it another 130,000 square feet. Oh, my God. So there we are me educational, getting products out. My infiltration, my next big step. You know, I'm now on the board of the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Foundation. The lady that's helping subsidize that I talked about before, Integrated Medicine at the Cornell, is now on the board. And I befriended this amazing lady who... Her mentor was the guy that wrote a book way back called The Green Pharmacy. When he passed, she inherited all his work, his medicinal plant garden, and I she have the came green in. Pharmacy. Oh, do you? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, but I have that book. Okay. Yeah. This lady, Andrea Otteson, came in to the FDA, and her specialty was the microbiome and how different soil levels affect the, the microbiome, which affects the health of humans. And then a couple of years ago, she was put over to the head of the animal division. Wow. And she is truly one of us. She is That's frustrated. So cool. She's presenting papers for grants showing how kibble dog food is negatively affecting dog health. She is now on the board of the American Holistic Veterinary Medical Foundation with me. That's so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put all of this together so we could just get acceptance of the truth. Yeah. I'm not making them wrong. We need what conventional medicine does because I did it for 50 years. We yeah. need both. So that's the horizon. Yeah, that's incredible. Last question before we kind of wrap up here. If pet parents were to try and get, let's say, you know, you're the average pet parent, you're getting your kibble from the regular grocery store, you're not really adding much to it, but they want to start taking their pet's health into their own hands. Where do you recommend starting? Get a copy of my book. Nice. Not to sell a book, who cares? You know, make 80 cents on a book. <laughs> you know, I have to sell another 100,000 books to even get a dividend, and we don't care. It's, right. you know, we, there's a lot of good books out there right now. We, my first book is still selling more than my, my, my second book. And it was 25 years old. Wow. I watched the documentary. It really shows the need for integrative medicine. Yeah, I absolutely love there's that. There's so much knowledge out there right now. And proper Google searches is going to teach you a lot. No and yeah. this is the biggie. When I lecture, even to veterinarians, and I show these mind-boggling reversals of chronic degenerative hopeless cases, I say, I actually consult, or I have two consultants I go to every single day on every case. And those two consultants are common sense and nature. And guess what? You have access to those consultants too. Like, why, what is disease? Read the label of a commercial pet food and sit back and say, will the dog eat this in the wild? You know, the second time Martha had me on her show, we were allowed to put up a formula almost identical to the formula that sponsored her show without the name of the formula. And the first ingredient was corn. She allowed me to put this formula up the ingredient list, and the producers allowed me to turn to Martha and say, hey, Martha, have you ever seen a dog stalk an ear of corn? <laughs> I found out from her producer, who was my producer for my show, that they got more calls from that line than they did in the last three months. Wow. That is Makes incredible. Sense. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Dr. Marty, we cannot thank you enough for coming on today. I mean, you are absolutely inspirational. You are the father of all of this that we're trying to teach. And I think that, I mean, if any, if there's going to be anyone that our audience gets an, a, an absolute tremendous amount of value from, it's going to be you. So we cannot thank you more for spending a your pleasure. time. pleasure. This is my life. I love animals. I hate seeing them. 
especially with all the cancer they're getting right now. It just, I just know why they're getting it. I know how to help them once they get it, get it better. But why even go there? Yeah. When you take like Elsa, who had six weeks to live because cancer was eating her whole body. And then she's running around seven years later. If, if it has the ability to do that with a dog so terminal, imagine if you started their life with that. How much, not only money would you save on conventional therapy, but how the dog wouldn't have to have their leg amputated, how they don't have to suffer on these drugs crippled, half their jaw removed. They would live long, happy, healthy lives. I told you, I started the show by saying all the males on my mother's side of the family are long dead. I'll be 77 in five months. I have literally not been sick in 35 to 40 years, except three days of COVID. I'm 58 wow. years older than my youngest daughter. Wow. And it's great to live this way. I mean, it's, it's just, it's the way you should live. And I'm still having a great time. I know how to get really healthy, but I'm not willing to go there yet because I'm having such a good time. <laughs> yeah, totally. You got to keep your pizza and all that. Just oh, like yeah. the dogs. I love wine. I love IPAs. Why not? <laughs> I love it. Well, thank you again, Dr. Marty. And for those of you that are listening, thank you so much for spending your time with us today. We greatly appreciate it. And as always, I'm Bryce. I'm Kenzie. We're the creators of the BK Pets, and we'll see you in the next episode. Bye.